how the newspaper found us. But anyhow, they put us together and uh, we made a, told our story to the teachers. And uh, at this uh, workshop, one of the survivors was a former French hidden child. Uh, he uh, lost his mother and his uh, two sisters who were arrested and uh, when they rounded up the Jews in Paris, but he survived. And he invited me to lunch, and during lunch he said, have you seen the uh, uh, memorial to the Jews uh, published uh, in France? And I said, no, what is that? And he came up with a book that's about this thick, and it contains a list of all the 75 convoys that left the suburb of Paris, Drancy, uh, for Auschwitz. And since I knew what date my parents were arrested, I began to look at the convoys after that date, and I found that the name of my mother and my father on convoy number 28, which left Paris on September the 4th, 1942, and arrived in Auschwitz in, uh, two days later on September the 6th. So that was the first time that I had some uh, definite, definitive proof of what happened to them. So. Until, until that time, the German government established a, an arbitrary date of death, and they told me that my parents died on the 8th of May, 1945. That happens to be the day when Germany surrendered unconditionally. So this was strictly arbitrary. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, right here. The question is, Peter, have you been back to that area? Yes, I have been back to the area on a number of occasions. Uh, the first time, I guess, was when uh, the movie, the documentary, Weapons of the Spirit, was being filmed. Uh, I went back to Le Chambon for the first time. Um, I also, at that time, visited Auch and uh, Condon uh, and other places. Uh, and uh, I also spent considerable time trying to locate Mrs. Cavaillon in the Marseille area where she was from. Uh, and uh, I've also been back a number of times. Oh, the, the, about uh, four years ago, the BBC did another documentary, uh, and they invited me to uh, uh, come to Europe, and they filmed me in all of the locations that I mentioned in my diary. So they filmed me in, in Osh, in Condon, in Fijac, at the border crossing point into Switzerland, uh, and so forth. So yes, I've been back several times, and as a matter of fact, this summer, my wife and I were going back to uh, spend some time in uh, Germany and in Austria. Thank you. How did you end up with your first diary returning to you? Okay. There are so many weird circum circumstances. In 1982, uh, I was working uh, for a consulting firm in Washington, in Arlington, Virginia at the time, uh, the firm had a contract with the Algerian government, a six-year-long six uh, contract for bringing Algerian high school students to the United States and put them through universities and turn them into mechanical engineers. Anyhow, in the last year of the contract, they decided to sue our company for breach of, con uh, of contract. Uh, I went to our attorney in Washington at the time. I said, listen, I need an international attorney. Who could you recommend? He gave me the name of a man in Paris, Samuel Pizarre, who, by the way, has also wrote a book, a very interesting book. Anyhow, I went to see Samuel Pizarre in Paris. I exposed my case to him. He said, gee, you speak French very well. Where did you learn your French? Well, I went to school in Belgium and in France and Switzerland. Where in France? Well, I was in Auch and Condon and Chambon, Le Chambon sur Lignon. Yes. He said, ah. Oh, I happen to have a cousin, he's a film producer in Hollywood. He's about to do a documentary on the uh, village of Le Chambon. Do you mind if I give him your name? So this is how I wound up in the movie of Weapons of the Spirit, the documentary. When that movie was shown in uh, movie theaters in France in 1987, uh, I received a letter from someone in Paris saying, are you the Pierre Feigl who dedicated the uh, diary to his parents? If so, I have your diary. And I thought this was a scam. I wrote back to the man, this was before email, and uh, I asked him, uh, send me a photocopy of a page. Sure enough, it's my diary. Well, at the time I was commuting across the Atlantic just about every four or five weeks. I stopped in Paris the next time I went to see the man. Um, he, his name was David Diamant, and uh, he says, oh, well, I said, where did you get my diary? He said, well, uh, I bought it on the flea market in the south of France, somewhere in Nice or Cannes. I don't remember exactly where, uh, but I'm a collector of such memorabilia. 
And uh, I bought it about three, four years after the end of the war. And by the way, I published your diary in 1976 because I had assumed that you died. So that is how I got found it again. So now I said, I want my diary back. <laughs> the SOB wouldn't give it back to me. <laughs> he demanded money. So I parted with $265, but I got my diary back. So <laughs> that's how I got my first diary back. <coughs> yes, young lady. How did you learn so many languages so quickly? That's also a good question. But uh, when you're young, at your age, if you were to be put into a Spanish-speaking school from one day to the next, I guarantee you that within six months you would be fluent in Spanish. Young children learn languages very quickly. And how does a baby learn English? You're not giving him vocabulary lessons. You're not giving him grammar lessons or her grammar lessons. They pick it up. They hear it. They try to imitate the sounds. They put two and two together, what they view with the word, and that's how they learn a language. And that really is the simplest way of learning a language. I regret that in this school, in this country, we don't require young children to learn a foreign language. It's a real <laughs> mind opener. So. <coughs> Other questions? As a teenager, how did you deal with grieving the loss of your parents? Uh, again, it may sound simplistic, but as a 13, 14 year old, as an only child, uh, I guess the, the one overwhelming thought was at the time, who in the hell is going to look after me? I'm all alone. Who's going to feed me? Uh, what's going to happen to me? And it uh, may sound selfish, but that, that really was the overriding uh, thought that I had. I truly believed that I would see my parents again. Uh, when the novena was over and they weren't returned to me, I started to ask a lot of questions, um, and uh, I didn't get the right answers. Uh, but uh, little by little, of course, the uh, euphemism for relocation in the East, uh, news began to solidify this was really, there are some death camps out there, they are killing Jews, and I finally had to assume that my parents were probably among the unfortunate ones uh, that were killed in one of those camps. But as I said, I didn't find that out until 1992, 93, when I saw this book, uh, The Memorial to the Jews. I might add, if I may for a moment too, uh, there was a woman, uh, a teacher in France, who uh, about uh, seven years ago was asked to put together a curriculum to teach the Holocaust uh, to the children in the town of Osh, where I where I was, where my parents lived. And she came across the first diary that had been published in France in 1976. She tracked me down. Uh, and uh, she, with the uh, backing of the French Ministry of Education, had access to uh, archives, municipal, uh, national archives, and so forth. And she published this in a book that came out um, about a year ago. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, deported children, saved children, and most of the documents that she found, uh, including documents that are stamped top secret and so forth, uh, pretty much document everything that's in my diary. Uh, when I say in my diary that uh, the gendarmes came to arrest me on such and such a date, she has the logbook of the gendarmerie saying on that date, ordered to pick up Pierre Feigl at Chateau Monteleone at 2 o'clock, found him to be sick, too sick uh, to be moved, will return on another day. Uh, she found my arrest report uh, by the Swiss authorities, the interrogation uh, by the Swiss authority. She found my mugshot that the Swiss took of me uh, holding a slate with my name on it. Uh, this, is, uh, this was then put into a, a refugee identity card that the Swiss issued to me. So uh, just about documented everything that I'm saying in my, in my diary. I say it has been made bulletproof. If anyone wants to challenge it, they are the official documents to prove that it's the truth. I'm in the process of translating it. It's in French. I'm on page 61. I'm stuck on page 61. I've been stuck on it now for about six or seven months. I promise I'm going to resume the translation. So. Is there anybody else up there that I missed? 
right, right there, and then we'll come down. Wait a minute, what was the question? Oh, does Judaism play a role, in your life? Oh, play a role, <coughs> a role in your life? Okay, the answer to that is, sorry, Rabbi. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid it is not. And um, when I came to the United States, uh, my grandmother, my aunt, who had made it to the States, uh, the first question they asked me, well, now that you're here, what are you going to do for a living? And I said, I want to get into the air aircraft industry. I want to be a pilot. And they said, well, you can't do that. And I said, why not? And I was told, well, they don't hire Jews. And I said, well, I'm not a Jew. So I essentially uh, denied, uh, denied. I still have trouble, first of all, today to uh, accept that being Jewish is a matter of race. If Sammy Davis Jr. can convert to Judaism, <laughs> then it isn't a question of race, OK? <laughs> so uh, I lived with this. And uh, for career purposes, I never revealed to my children or to anyone what my background was. I didn't do that until my oldest daughter was 18, when uh, she started to ask some question. And then for the first time, I trotted out uh, the real story. So if that answers you. Thank you. And what's the question for Alex, please? She wants to know where you found your diaries that you researched. Uh, were they in English, or did, were they in other languages? Where did you do your, your research? So the diaries really were all over archives and with survivors in the United States and um, abroad. Um, the research mostly began by reading as much as I could about the Holocaust. And any time I found a reference to a diary, I would track it down. Um, some of the material came to me in English. For example, Peter had already translated his diary in English by the time I learned about it. So I was able to use his translation of his diary in salvaged pages. Um, in many cases, I had to have material translated into English, which, you know, by the time I got ready to put the book together and write it, I had found um, nearly 60 diaries kept by teenagers. So, you know, just doing the math, it was thousands of pages of material, and much of it had not been translated. So. I had um, survivors and friends who were able to sometimes do rough translations for me, and then um, I, we would make a, a formal translation or a literary translation from, from that. But the, the material really was everywhere. And I found it sometimes by being very methodical, writing to the major archives, writing to major historians, you know, putting out feelers as wide, kind of as I, widely as I could. And sometimes material came to me by accident. You know, I would meet somebody and somebody would say, oh, I know somebody who has a diary, or someone would donate something to the Holocaust Museum, as happened with Peter's diary. And because people knew of the work that I was doing over time, they would call me and say, you know, we've, we've just gotten something in the archives that you might be interested in. So the material really grew from this sort of seven or eight or nine diaries that I knew of in 1992 to nearly 60 by the time I was ready to, to publish the book. Thank you. Uh, I saw a couple. Two, two, two more questions, so we have time for book signing. Yes, and we're someone, having a reception. Yeah, someone right? up there. Yeah. Yes, OK. Um, right here, I see. Does it get any easier to speak about this? And where do you get the strength to talk about these things? Well, it definitely has gotten easier. Uh, when I first told my story, uh, the moment when I, my father disappeared from my view on the crest of a hill, uh, in the beginning, I, I would break down and I would have to say, hold it for a minute, OK? I, I had to collect myself again. So it has gotten easier uh, in that sense. Uh, I should also add here that uh, for those of you who might uh, wonder, why can he be so happy? Why such levity in telling the story? Uh, in part, because during the war, I learned about what is called gallows humor. And uh, even in the worst situation, uh, to survive, uh, you've got to kid about some of these things. You can't take life too serious. It helps you stay alive. So uh, that, that's why I, I do this. Okay, we only have one more. And Peter, I can't do this. You pick it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a hand up there on the top there in the middle. Okay. You were a teenager when these things were going on, and he's wondering if you ever lost faith that you were going to make it out alive. Uh, 
I think, to be perfectly honest about it, I basically lived from day to day. I uh, didn't think much about long range. Uh, in a way, I suppose I was blessed. My wife is, uh, abs actually resents the fact that uh, whenever I have been in situations that are very difficult, for instance, at one stage, it looked like my company was going to uh, uh, go into bankruptcy. And uh, I would walk out of the office at 5 in the afternoon or 6 in the afternoon on a Friday, and I turned off a mental switch. And I wouldn't think about it. Wouldn't consider it until the following Monday morning, not when I left the house to go to work, but when I opened the door to my office and stepped into it. That's when I turned the switch back on. Because I said, there isn't anything I can do about it. My worrying about it over the weekend isn't going to help one bit. So I have this ability or defect, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> uh, to just wipe things out of my mind, forget about them, and uh, what, will, what should, happens, happens. So... <laughs> <laughs> we are having a reception in the lobby, and the other really good news is we have Alex's book, Salvage Pages, and we also have a book that Peter has another chapter in. And so uh, please join us in the lobby, and let's give them another huge thank you.